Imagine America in the 1730s in a way the history books have never shown you. Pretend for a moment that television news existed back then. I know, they didn't have TV back in 1733, but imagine if they did. What would a news report from the new town of Savannah have looked like? Let's find out as we join the Colonial Evening News in progress. This is the Colonial Evening News with Jonathan Patrick, live from Williamsburg. Good evening, I'm Jonathan Patrick. In the news tonight, the war for Polish succession has taken a dramatic turn as King Stanislaw I has been deposed and replaced by Augustus III. Philadelphia's Province Hall is starting to take shape after more than three years of construction. And Boston printer Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac celebrates its second year of publication, and already such maxims as a penny saved is a penny earned are becoming part of the American lexicon. Now, our cover story tonight, the new Georgia colony. It is America's youngest colony, the 13th, named for our beloved king, His Royal Majesty, King George II. It is a raw place, perched between the Savannah and the Altamaha rivers on our southern frontier. Threats of mosquitoes, heat, illness, Spanish attack are but a few of the challenges facing this new Georgia colony. But a small group of dedicated colonists from the London area, led by philanthropist and utopian idealist James Oglethorpe, are determined to make a go of it. Correspondent Rebecca Wright is with us now, live from the outpost known as Savannah, for an exclusive first-hand look at how the new Georgia colonists are faring. Rebecca. Well, John, it's more than a year after the first colonists stepped off of the Anne onto Georgian soil, and Savannah is really beginning to look and feel like a town. There are finished houses, streets, even public squares. Despite the early hardships, illness and death faced by these loyal British subjects, Savannah and Georgia appear to have a good chance at succeeding beyond the trustees' initial hopes and plans. Why did you decide to come to Georgia anyway? Well, for new opportunities and adventure. My husband is here and my family are here with me, so we're going to make a go of it. It all started with James Oglethorpe. He dreamed of a place where people could live and work without fear of debt or prison. In fact, Georgia was not founded as a debtor's colony, although some colonists have been debtors in the past. Instead, the first colonists were the working poor, craftsmen, farmers, and shopkeepers. King George liked Oglethorpe's plan. He saw Georgia's potential for producing silk, indigo for dyes, and tobacco. Besides, Queen Caroline wanted more silk dresses and the supply of silk from China and Europe was limited. More than 114 colonists and their families made the Atlantic crossing to America on the Anne. Two infants died on board. Another was baptized, a boy named Georgius. And unfortunately, a dog was lost overboard. They arrived at Charlestown, South Carolina in mid-January 1733. Soon Oglethorpe found a place upriver to build what he called Savannah on a high bluff called Yamacraw. Well, what did you think the moment you first arrived in Savannah? The marsh was beautiful. It was something I'd never seen before. Grasses growing all along the riverside like that. And there are trees everywhere and the lack of buildings and the lack of civilian life. It was drastically different. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the weather? The weather is hot, <laughs> humid, and the insects. There are insects that you can't even see. The Indians call them noceums, uh, and it's very difficult to see, but they bite and leave a sting. Oglethorpe designed a town with public squares and wide boulevards. Indian chief Tomachichi and his tribe have welcomed the Georgia colonists and have helped them adapt to this new and strange land. The Native Americans seemed eager to trade, and some even have interest in Christianity. But amid the progress, there are rumors of discontent. Is everyone getting along within this community? Um, that's a question you'd have to ask my husband. Mm -hmm. Mary Tate's husband and others were unwilling to say anything that would upset Oglethorpe, whom they call father. But there is grumbling about rum and slaves. Both are forbidden by the royal charter. The trustees fear that rum and slaves 
would encourage laziness in a plantation economy. But this wilderness is much more difficult to tame than had been anticipated. Slaves would ease that burden. In fact, we have evidence that some colonists are renting slaves from South Carolina plantation owners just across the river. Nonetheless, most of the families we talk to say they are doing well. Well, how are your children? They're doing fine. Uh, they're adjusting well. It's all a new adventure for them, mm -hmm. and, and they're very happy. Elizabeth, you've been living in Savannah for about a year now. What do you miss most from England? Probably the, my friends, the parties, the city life. Mm -hmm. Your dress is very pretty, but it's more of a practical dress. Do you miss some of the well, beautiful, rich cloths that come from England? Well, definitely the dresses were a whole lot prettier, and I like them a whole lot more. But after a year, you get used to them. Are you making friends here? Pretty much, but most of my friends are back in England. About two or three came over here. Oh, that's good. Well, maybe you can correspond with them and send them letters and things. Well, I tried to write one of my friends a letter, and it took. I've, I, I have, still haven't gotten a response back. How long ago was that? I think about six months ago. The illness and death that first summer nearly overwhelmed this young settlement. Nearly one third of the original settlers died. No one knows the cause, but it appears that bad water from the marsh and the extreme heat are a lethal combination. But now Savannah's population is growing, around 500. The colony of Georgia has been called by some Oglethorpe's Folly. Others have a contrary view, that Georgia and her vast riches of timber and other natural resources will soon prove a valuable jewel in the crown of Britain and America. But Jonathan, only time will tell which view is more accurate. Now, Rebecca, is it fair to say that Georgia is more valuable to the crown as a barrier against a possible invasion of the American colonies from French and Spanish holdings to the south? The Georgia trustees believe that Savannah and its outlying settlements and farms will act as a buffer between nations hostile to the crown and Carolina. The question is whether or not this threat can be held at bay by the mere presence of the Georgia colony. Or will James Oglethorpe and the colonists have to use force to protect themselves and our southern flanks? Interesting story, Rebecca. We look forward to future reports as things progress down there in Savannah. In other news, Nadir Shah has been named one of the great Asian conquerors of all time after defeating the Ottoman Turks and capturing... With its many squares and symmetrical layout, Savannah is known as the first planned city in America. 